Dear guests here at uh, Chateau Neuf and online, welcome to this uh, panel conversation. Uh, my name is Arne Melsson. I'm the deputy chair of the Hong Kong Committee in Norway. Uh, the present panel will discuss China-Norway relationship, normalization and trading. The most recent document on the Norwegian government's China strategy is a white paper from 2007. So you might think that the Norway-China relationship has not changed over the past 15 years. Well, you would be wrong. When Liu Xiaobo became the 2010 P uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Beijing reacted with rage. In the following six years, diplomatic relations were in a state of hibernation. It took a very controversial statement from the Norwegian government to thaw these relations. When preparing for today's seminar, we sent invitations to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Trade, and the Ministry of Justice and Public Security Unfortunately, they all responded that not a single representative had the opportunity to take part. I would say that there are strong indications that the situation inside the Norwegian government, with respect to topics discussed at our seminar here today, remains rather tense, which makes the present conversation all that more relevant. Shortly after the white paper was published in 2007, Norway and China started negotiating with the aim of reaching an agreement on free trade. These negotiations were suspended by the Chinese government in 2010 and was taken up some months after relations were re-established in December 2016. Then in 2010, 2020, uh, Penn Norway organized a panel conversation on our trade relations with China. Iselin Nybø, then Minister of Trade, stated that a free trade agreement would be finalized within months, not years. Now more than two years have passed and no agreement has been presented to the parliament. We live in times in which world politics is in motion and this calls for Norway to reconsider its relations, particularly with respect to countries that seek to reshape the world order in favor of autocratic dictatorships. We are very fortunate to have Aftenposten's correspondent, Christopher Renneberg, as moderator for this conversation. Christopher has traveled all over China in years where, uh, when he has not been denied a visa. No Norwegian journalist knows China, its people, and its contrasts better than Christopher. Give him a hand and welcome to the stage, Christopher. Thank you very much, Arne, for those very kind and uh, I would say imprecise words. There are many Norwegian journalists who know a lot about China, but thank you. Uh, and thank you to all of you for, for being here uh, today. Um, We'll do this uh, session in English as well. Uh, oh, that's a deep, good chair. Uh, I just want to start off by sharing um, uh, an anecdote uh, from 2018 when I, uh, I was in China for the state uh, visit by the Norwegian king and queen. Because I, I think this is a short anecdote. It, it illustrates something about the relationship between Norway and, and China. So um, this was two years after the, the peace agreement between Norway and China, and there was a big state visit, uh, the first in, in many years, about 300 people in the delegation from, uh, from the Norwegian business community. And everyone was happy that things were back to normal and that they could start making money again. Uh, and I was standing outside the Great Hall of the People um, with uh, some of the delegation uh, waiting for this uh, big meeting between uh, King Harold and, and uh, Xi Jinping. And I, I caught, uh, sort of uh, to my side, I caught the Chinese ambassador to Norway. Uh, and I figured I would go over to him and I would say, thank you for granting me a visa because it had been a very long time since I'd been granted the visa uh, to China. Uh, so I figured I, I'd do the polite thing and, and uh, thank him. So I went over to him and I, I shook his hand. And uh, as soon as he realized who I was, his, he just stiffened. Uh, and I said, so Mr. Ambassador, uh, I'd just like to say thank you for, for granting me a visa. I'm very happy to be here. And he looked at me sternly and he said, uh, well, thank goodness it's the last time. <laughs> <laughs> and then he turned his back to me. Uh, and, and for me, I think that illustrates a part of uh, the challenge that uh, 
that we have in this relationship. China is more than happy to have Norwegian, uh, uh, the Norwegian business community as a partner and to have Norwegian politicians uh, come to visit them and, and, uh, and engage in, in, in international conversations. But when it comes to a critical view of what happens in China, um, there is very little tolerance. Uh, and I think we can see from the statements we've seen from the Norwegian government over these past uh, years that even though they claim to be critical behind closed doors, there's very little evidence of that uh, as soon as those doors are open and they talk to the public. So uh, with that in mind, um, uh, I'd like to call, uh, I think, the whole panel to the stage at the same time um, so that I can introduce them uh, um, and then we can start our conversation. So we have, um, we can start on the wall here, uh, Anish Mognus. Um, you are uh, also a former China correspondent. I don't know if you can see me, we, but we can see you. I can see you, uh, Christopher, that's good. That's excellent. So you're in Bergen, um, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll be talking to you uh, uh, virtually like this. And yeah. uh, in the room with us, uh, we are fortunate to have uh, uh, Mikhail Tetschner, uh, an acting member of parliament for, for the Conservative Party, uh, previous uh, vice chair of the Foreign Relations Committee in, uh, in parliament. We have Rosmus Hansson, a uh, member of parliament for the Green Party. And we have Seattle Wiedswang, a uh, commentator at uh, the Norwegian newspaper Dagens Næringsliv. So if the three of you could please um, take the stage to a warm welcome from this uh, beautiful audience. Um, now, relations between Norway and China go way back. If you, if you see um, uh, pictures of old uh, ships in Hong Kong, you might notice that some of them have uh, Norwegian Swedish flags uh, indicating that trade was going on way before the, the People's Republic of China was, was established. Uh, and as soon as the People's Republic was established in uh, 1949, it took uh, less than a year before Norway had established diplomatic relations with the, the new leadership in, in Beijing. It was among the first countries to do so. And uh, relations have been uh, fairly good up until uh, 2010, uh, and uh, that is one of the topics we'll be talking about today. Um, and I'd actually like to start there, and I'd like to start with you, Mikal, um, because we don't have representatives of the government here, uh, not the present and not the previous. Uh, but you were in Parliament, in the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, for, for a long time, and you, you've seen part of this process from, from another perspective than what most of uh, the rest of us have. So could you uh, explain what did it actually cost Norway uh, that Liu Xiaobo was, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in, in 2010? Yes. Um uh, when you mention uh, costs, I think uh, you uh, would refer to, to the, um, the benefits from trade. Um, so, some critics of the common de um, declaration said afterwards that it was not easy to see any change in Norwegian export uh, to China. Uh, even in, in the years we spent in the, the, the freeze box. So, um, you know, um, internationally you will trade uh, what you have and uh, your customer will come if you have something to offer uh, to a reasonable and uh, competitive price. So this was more a battle on the political uh, um, uh, on the political scheme, uh, where uh, the, the more the, the mental um, uh, limitation of Norwegian uh, foreign policy was uh, was, was uh, connected to, to the um, uh, Peace Prize award to Liu Xiaobo, and uh, 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 our committee. I had uh, a, a very interesting conversation with the CCP in Beijing uh, in, 19, in 2018 when we w went to a um, study tour um, and, and we went, of course, to the CCP's uh, headquarters and also to the 
the parliament. And um, this said to us that they were fully aware of the, the difference between the, the, the Nobel Peace Prize Committee and the Norwegian government. But they didn't like the way the former um, Prime Minister of Norway, Mr. Jagland, had used this in articles, in speeches, and um, they uh, said to us that they were offended by his um, way of speaking about China in general. So then they had a discussion internally, and they came out with this, um, uh, you could say they, they freezed the connection to, to the official um, Norway uh, authorities. So, so they were fully, uh, in spite of what many observers would say in the West, they were very clear of the distinction be between the, the private uh, noble um, institute and the government. But they use this as a tool to punish Norway. And that's the way a powerful nation treats small nations. But that put Norway in a conundrum, uh, because if they recognize that difference between the Nobel Committee and the government, and they also required from the Norwegian government to, uh, to distance itself even more from the committee and to issue some, for the, some form of a, apology, uh, it, it, it made the situation very difficult for the government. And, and eventually they, they came to some agreement with this uh, 2016 document that we'll be talking about a bit later. But um, just to run some, some numbers, during these six years uh, of Norway being in the, in the freezer or the icebox or uh, sort of being a, a country non grata in, in China, uh, exports, Norwegian exports to China doubled. Uh, yet we heard all the time from Norwegian companies that this was costing them dearly, that this was uh, very bad for, for business uh, for Norway. So, uh, yeah, maybe I can ask you, why did, why did we get this impression from, from the Norwegian business community that it was bad for business when exports to China doubled? Because it probably was. The, 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 the HUD, well, invisible uh, problems, uh, not organized, not, not customs, but things took longer time, things was more, uh, they were more complicated, and they were complaining. But as I say, it increased, and it well, kept on increasing, and I think, uh, well, then they surpassed anyone else at the main trading partner outside the EU uh, for, no, for Norway. So, well, so top law now, 20, one was it with uh, 140 billion with kroner in trade between uh, Norway and China? So it's keep on increasing. Um, uh, and on this, uh, since uh, uh, it's difficult to see if you have your hand up, but uh, just I'd like to encourage all of you to to uh, to let me know if you if you have a, uh, anything you'd like to say. But uh, uh, I can ask you since. Uh, there was the situation. Norway, uh, China was punishing Norway for something that uh, an independent committee had done. Uh, could that also have been an opportunity for the Norwegian government to say uh, clearly that there is a difference between uh, the committee and and uh, and the government, which which they did, but also that uh, it is unacceptable to bully a country the way that uh, obviously uh, China did to Norway in the situation. Well. Obviously, and uh, uh, the most interesting thing about all this is why they didn't, because Norway tends to do that in other situations. We have Russia, uh, with which Norway is very loud and clear uh, on most issues, and has always been so. Uh, in, an, in, in, a, in a straightforward, orderly matter, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so to understand what kind of syndrome uh, that developed towards China and is still, um, uh, well, is, is still kind of ruling uh, the Norwegian uh, politics towards China is extremely interesting. And I don't have the answers, but it, 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 it puzzles me. 
uh, that uh, both the, the, the obvious uh, point that you're making, uh, that Norway could be much clearer, and Norwegian government could be much clearer on the difference between the community and, and, uh, and the government, and our way of doing things, and uh, uh, the, the general uh, very strong and unwillingness to, to make clear statements uh, on Chinese politics whatsoever, given the fact that our trade is increasing, given the fact that the uh, perceptive problems that we are having in China with China are not quite obvious. Uh, that's uh, that's a, a kind of political mystery to to me, and uh, I'm looking forward to digging more into it. Anders, uh, you were in uh, Beijing for, for part of this uh, this period. Uh, what did it look like from from that perspective in in this uh, sort of difficult time for for bilateral relations? I arrived in uh, Beijing just uh, uh, before the Nobel Peace Prize award. Uh, and in th those short uh, months, uh, it was a lot of Norwegian uh, politicians, especially from the government, that was ascending on Beijing. Um, uh, also, the, the foreign minister, Jonas Gajstør, was there. I was approached by the deputy um, foreign minister of China. Uh, she, uh, she brought me to the most exclusive restaurants in uh, Beijing and asked me to avoid uh, the peace prize to Liu Xiaobo. Um, I said to her, I couldn't do that, but she uh, thought since I was in the uh, state-owned um, uh, broadcasting company, I could do something. So she was very disappointed at me. And, and just um, after the award, um, nobody in the Chinese government uh, would talk to me anymore. So from being very uh, well welcomed the first two months, um, the next four years I spoke to no one except uh, on the daily um, press conferences at the foreign ministry. But uh, to solve the puzzles uh, that Rasmus was uh, talking about, uh, I think I have the answer because um, business people, they were going in and out of Beijing all the time. And uh, as you said, Christopher, the, the trade was increasing. There were no problems with the trade. And even uh, the salmon came in from Vietnam. So uh, everybody was happy. And uh, sometimes I also um, met on uh, business people from Norway. They disguised themselves as Swedes. So they circumvented the, the cold uh, response from the Chinese. And uh, the import and export, uh, it went uh, very well and increased very much. But I think uh, the problem was with the Norwegians, uh, Norwegian politicians. They were very anxious that they were not allowed to talk to uh, this big nation that would uh, eventually become the leader of the world. And they wanted to have uh, connections because uh, in Norway, politicians think they are very important and uh, uh, very uh, much master the global scene, uh, like we see in, um, for instance, climate policy now. We should uh, rescue the world. And if we um, should be able to rescue the world, for instance, in the climate uh, uh, question, we need to speak to the Chinese government. I think that is the reason for the, the so-called common agreement, uh, that uh, Norwegian politicians wanted to come into uh, the good side uh, of the Chinese government. I, I'd like to uh, uh, stick with you here, uh, Anders, and I, I'm just going to read the, the text of that agreement, uh, just point three, because that's... Uh, uh, in my mind, the most... Uh, oh, there it is. Wonderful. Um, so the Norwegian government fully respects China's development path and social system and highly commends its historic and unparalleled development that has taken place. The Norwegian government reiterates its commitment to the One China policy, fully respects China's sovereignty and territorial integrity, attaches high importance to China's core interests and major concerns, will not support actions that undermine them, 
and will do its best to avoid any future damage to the bilateral relations. Now, Anush, you have worked in politics or covered politics uh, and uh, international politics for a long time. Uh, do you know of any other international documents that look like this? No, it's very, very special. And what is uh, very important with this paragraph three is that it, it prohibits Norway to criticize uh, 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 the, uh, the Uyghur uh, policy in China. It, it uh, prohibits us to say anything about uh, the uh, human rights situation, both in, uh, in Xinjiang and in Tibet. And it also prohibits us to take side with China. We are in agreement with uh, China that the, it's their right to uh, access uh, Taiwan. So um, if there is going to be um, a, a conflict between China and Taiwan, this document um, says that we should side with China. Chetil, uh, you were first. <coughs> uh, I do think we're is in the middle of some, some kind of adjustment process that we do not know where we would end. For decades, Norwegian politicians, European politicians, saw what was happening uh, in China as an advantage. It was the globalization uh, lifted hundred million people up from poverty on one hand, we got the cheap goods uh, on the other hand. Uh, they had these human rights issues, they had, uh, well, uh, dictatorship, but still they thought that it was that important with this global economic power to have good relations and especially uh, in the climate question. Then it's been the adjustments over the last year because of what's happening in, in Hong Kong, because of the war in uh, Ukraine uh, and, and uh, the question of, of Taiwan. And, but I still feel that I need to talk to them. They still uh, say they have one big conflict going on in Ukraine. Uh, it's like uh, Scholz, who was in Beijing some weeks ago, said that, uh, well, uh, that, that we, we can just fight one war at a time. We, uh, we have to sort out this trouble with, uh, with Russia and then Probably it will come up with something totally different to China, but we do not know what it will be yet. Mikhail, uh, it was a foreign minister from your party who signed this agreement in 2016, and he was incredibly proud. I remember that day very clearly. Um, is it a good piece? Of, is it a good document? Um, well, uh, uh, if you have to bring party politics into this, you also have to to uh, bear in mind that uh, this was a long-going process uh, started uh, under the previous government. But it's, uh, uh, the statement is uh, peculiar. And you see also the, the, the angle they, they choose uh, if you go to the paragraph two, where uh, the, the Norwegian negotiators uh, acknowledge that the Nobel Peace Prize is a problem Th that should be uh, should have been uh, lifted off the table and if you see the whole document it's a one-way document we are the one to obey or uh, give in uh, and they are in the position to require what our politics should be there are no balance. There are no uh, paragraph four or five uh, talking about uh, Norwegians aspects, Norwegians uh, or Western uh, pers uh, perspectives at all. Um, there are no uh, uh, um, uh, a knowledge of that also uh, China has a long way to come to, to, to fully live up to, to the charter, uh, UN charter. There's not, nothing of that. So um, in the beginning we are getting credit because we were very early to recognize the Mao, uh, the Communist uh, parties uh, establish a, a, a new state in 1949. That's a very good thing. And then, uh, and, and then they praise that we have had um, uh, good or not hostile um, relationship to, uh, during the years after. And then they're bringing in, in paragraph two, 
the Nobel Peace Prize Committee. That should be irrelevant. The, the Norwegian um, authorities cannot rule over an independent institute. We, we should have made that clear. We should uh, stand firm about the divisional power and division between the state and non-government organizations, and we didn't. I absolutely grant you the point that the China policy uh, in Norway has remained the same regardless of uh, which of the major parties are, are uh, in power. But uh, was it a mistake, do you think, to, to sign this document? I think the, the best of the document is that I'm told that this, the status is unclear, and when it comes to the hard, it's not uh, binding legally. What do you think uh, the Norwegian government should do about this, uh, this now six-year-old agreement? Well, uh, I, I, as far as I remember, Norway was also more or less the first nation to recognize the Soviet Union. Uh, in return for that, we got the Svalbard Treaty. Uh, in return for recognizing uh, China, we get this document, which is uh, an absolutely unbelievable document. It's a dictate from one nation uh, to another. There's nothing whatsoever about China's uh, obligations uh, in that document. It's just uh, a list of orders, uh, political orders, uh, from one nation to another, uh, which is probably, as uh, Gunnar Magnus and all the other people I've asked uh, say, there's, it's unique in, in, uh, in international diplomacy. And, and then back to uh, uh, Gunnar Magnus' solution to my, <laughs> to my puzzle. Anders. Anders, sorry. Uh, who's Gunnar Magnus? Uh, someone. That's sorry, my brother. Anders. Anders. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Um, um, uh, the answer is kind of uh, too banal to be true. Uh, if... If, if it's true that the kind of international hybris of uh, Norwegian politicians about their role as problem, global problem solvers is the reason why government after government accepts that a document like this uh, normalization declaration exists, uh, that still is hard to believe for me uh, why such a thing can happen. And I have asked uh, uh, Foreign Minister uh, uh, Wittfeldt if she uh, is prepared to declare that this document uh, does not have uh, any status whatsoever or that the government will disregard it somehow. She refuses to do that. In the parliament, she flatly refused it. At the same time, uh, she uh, insists that the document has no political uh, influence or consequences. And we also know that the document is not signed, uh, but, the, but the governments maintain or, or keeps, keep being unwilling to declare that the document doesn't exist. So to answer your initial question, it, be, it should be teared, torn to pieces uh, uh, in the parliament by uh, the prime minister so that everybody can see it because it is an unbelievable document. And I will, I will I just talk to Mikhail about it and then I'm, I'm going to follow up on, on trying to get rid of that document from Norwegian politics. But I, 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 I really struggle to understand the reason why uh, governments allow it to exist. All right, so that's a debate to, uh, to pay attention to in, in coming, uh, coming months, I guess. Uh, but time is running away from us quickly. Uh, we, we have other topics we have to, to talk about, um, but it's, it's related. Um, so one of, um, uh, there's a Chinese expression, uh, you kill the chickens to scare the monkeys. Uh, and that's, that's what this uh, agreement could be described as. It's uh, something that's done to one nation to scare maybe other nations from... Uh, from giving out prizes to, uh, to dissidents the way Norway or the Norwegian Nobel Committee did. 
Uh, but the reward for Norway um, was uh, not a Svalbard treaty, but it was uh, the resumption of, of a free trade agreement uh, discussion, the one that, um, that we heard from, from, uh, from Arne at the beginning here. Uh, so it had been dead for a long time, but then it was restarted. So Kjetil, uh, you, you work for the, the Business Daily. Uh, could you perhaps just briefly tell us what kind of agreement this is and why isn't it with EFTA where, uh, that Norway usually goes through in order to... Uh, to make these kinds of uh, free trade agreements? Some <coughs> different interests inside the EFTA as well. We do have different, uh, we have the Switzerland, and that's normally where we have, we have conflicts there. But, uh, well, with the different, different interests. Well, what happened with this now is that, uh, well, it's on, uh, they, uh, they were stopped in 10, start again after the agreement, the talks, we will, not happen anything soon and what I hear from the foreign department here is that they are waiting especially on what's happening in the EU because they are in that kind of adjustments process too but then we have a problem as well because Norway's tradition is closest ally, uh, ally. inside the EU is Germany and Germany are in a bit at odds with the other EU countries how to uh, how to relate uh, to China so well, we're in the waiting process, and I do not think there will be any trade agreement uh, in the foreseeable future with, uh, with Norway, or uh, as they planned with, uh, with the UN Germany. Mikhail, you, you've seen this process from the inside, uh, and uh, you've seen the development in China over the course of these years where Norway has been in negotiations. Uh, could you tell us something about the mood from from the perspective of, of uh, not the Norwegian government since, since you've been in, in parliament, but from sort of the official Norway. Uh, has the mood shifted towards a more critical uh, uh, way of looking at this, uh, these negotiations? Yes, uh, I think there uh, became a shift in the, the, um, the sentiment uh, after the, the security law of Hong Kong because um, if you are negotiating uh, any deal, also trade deals, of course, you have to rely on your counterpart. And uh, the China's ability or interest in uh, comply with the uh, international um, conventions and, and uh, agreements um, are uh, the last decade uh, deteriorated. You can see about uh, they had um, a rule on, on the island uh, dispute with the, the Philippines. Um, the rule was against China and they ignored it. You have the agreement with the UK about uh, handover, the, the conditions for the handover uh, agreement uh, in, back in uh, before uh, 1979. They, they broke it. So um, the eagerness of having a trade agreement with a powerful counterpart um, has de declined rapidly after the experience of how they de have dealt with previous um, conventions. So, and I think also Norway has to take notice of what we have learned. We should avoid bilateral uh, agreements with uh, China, we have to be a part of uh, with our um, ally in, in Europe <coughs> because only they could have the, the political th strength to uh, insist on um, compliance from our counterpart. And uh, yeah, as you said, the signals we we're receiving now from, from government as, as well is that uh, it's, it's not happening, at least uh, right now. Can I say something, uh, Christopher? Of course. Uh, I just uh, spoke to the chief negotiator in Norway about uh, this trade uh, agreement. And uh, he said that actually now it's uh, hinging on, uh, uh, on the Chinese. Uh, there are uh, uh, a clause that they are discussing at the moment, uh, which uh, the Chinese negotiator don't um, dare to um, uh, uh, to um, uh, complete uh, because 
uh, obviously they need uh, uh, some uh, uh, some um, clearance from uh, upper level, and that will be Xi Jinping. But he also said that in the Norwegian government there are no pressure uh, to go forward with uh, with uh, the negotiations. So he thinks uh, that uh, uh, the, the trade agreement, in practical uh, view, is dead. Um, I, I have just um, I just want to um, to add a comment. Uh, uh, Rasmus said that uh, it was unbelievable that uh, Norwegian politicians. Uh, uh, wanted <laughs> so badly this agreement. But I have been speaking to a lot of Norwegian politicians about this, um, even prime ministers, and they say that uh, Norway cannot live uh, without um, um, normalization with China. So it's the political uh, side of it that's most important. Mm. Uh, Rasmus, uh, your name was invoked here. Uh, uh, but Taking us back to the free trade agreement, uh, I know that you have a strong opinion on this. You've, you've raised the issue in, in Parliament and sent questions to the foreign minister about this. Uh, but isn't it uh, good to have trade with other countries? Isn't it good to uh, have a, uh, a channel to the uh, inside of the Chinese government where you could uh, deal with uh, issues, uh, other issues that might be interesting to talk about? Why, why do you think that Norway should scrap this uh, or, or stop these uh, negotiations? Well, it's, it's, it's absolutely good to have trade with other countries. Uh, uh, question is on what terms. Uh, and uh, the problem with uh, the ongoing or not ongoing negotiations on tr trade agreement with China is that it's closed. Uh, we are not uh, in any way being assured that uh, the necessary recommendations or, or uh, Betingelse conditions uh, are included uh, in the agreement or in the whatever text is there about human rights, about environment, about uh, fairness, about respect for international trade agreements, etc. Uh, and that's the reason uh, why those negotiations need to be stopped. And it's also interesting that we're not doing it through EFTA with the Mercosur uh, trade negotiations with the Latin American countries. We are going through EFTA. Uh, in parallel with the with the EU, uh, and I think it's a, it's a much more interesting road uh, to follow to do something like that towards China uh, together with other countries. Uh, so, um, from my perspective, and to be about parties uh, from from <laughs> from the Green Party's perspective, there's nothing wrong whatsoever to uh, have trade and have trade agreement with China. We should do it with all countries, uh, but the terms uh, are the question. And um, I have tried to both get information about the terms and information about the state of the negotiations. And I get nada uh, response from uh, from the ministries, uh, and that's not acceptable. When we, in addition, have this uh, this um, uh, document that we were just talking about uh, hanging over us uh, as a kind of democracy sword uh, that makes the whole uh, the whole framework of the agreement very uncertain. Is, is that document the framework for the agreement uh, or not? That's what we need to find out in order to uh, proceed. Uh, yeah, you, you mentioned um, uh, the EU, uh, uh, but th there's also another factor. We have the US, uh, Norway's most important ally, uh, clearly going in a very different direction uh, in terms of China policy, becoming much more critical. Uh, and now having sort of more or less declared technological war with this uh, export ban on microchips. If Norway yeah. were to, uh, even though it doesn't seem likely now, but if Norway were to go through with this negotiation and end up with an FDA with China, uh, what do you think rea the reaction would have been in, uh, in DC? Uh, well, this is split between the EU now and the US and Unit United Kingdom on, on the other side that have the more much more hawkish view on this. Uh, I think that in the foreseeable future, we will see some more or less blurred uh, result, uh, results of this. We started 
with uh, optimism and the Waddle durch Handel thinking in many countries that China would change if we traded with them. Uh, we've given up that thought, but now we're more in Bertolt Brecht, Mont Courage territory. Uh, we are too poor to have any moral. Uh, that uh, we need uh, want to isolate China to build, build up a new Cold War economic as during the first one. China is totally different from what Soviet Union is that. And isolation would well, uh, hurt the world market enormously. And then we have the hard climate question. So uh, th this question, th these problems are kicked uh, forward and we simply do not see any solution of them yet. It may take the, take the decades like the minerals. We've got all that uh, problem. We, we can dig up a lot of them. Uh, in Norway, in fact, on, on the southwest coast. But, well, then you have uh, all the people that live there that do not like that kind of mining. So, and that's the same problem all, all over uh, Western Europe. Mikael? Yes, um, I think from uh, all experience, we should uh, always uh, support the idea of, uh, of having trade also with the countries uh, far f from us uh, in cultural and political aspects and, and uh, you, you know the slogan you, you mentioned wandel uh, handel but we have to be cautious uh, in the, in the concrete uh, relation with uh, china because we are when we are talking about uh, change through trade uh, our, our imagination is that uh, this is a business to business without uh, um, heavily state involvement but here we are also uh, facing um, a forceful uh, state behind all the, the enterprises uh, making business and we have uh, uh, a lot of experience of um, China manipulating their currency uh, Chinese uh, businesses are uh, obliged, uh, obliged to, to report uh, and give away uh, information they, they get in the trade with uh, the rest of the world. And um, um, they also steal intellectual uh, property when they are co-investing. The Danish windmill uh, producer, Vestas, um, experience that uh, co to cooperate with in fact the state of China was to give away uh, intellectual property and then they, they met on the international global trade market the, the same uh, devices as the, they used to to produce so they didn't respect the patents the rights of patents so uh, we have to be assured that <coughs> Uh, wandel durch Handel not ends up with um, Handel durch Wandel. That we are changing ourselves and uh, renounce our principles because we want to trade. Well, I guess this is related to the whole sort of 90s thinking of, uh, of the end of history and that democracy was going to win uh, at a global level and that uh, all the authoritarian governments w would eventually become uh, more democratic. But uh, uh, just, uh, Mikhail, I'd just like to sort of stay with you here. I can sense, and I'm not sure if you've, you've changed your position a lot, but you have definitely become more outspoken in terms of uh, China. Do you predict that we might see something similar uh, at the government level in Norway, that there will be a shift, or do you think they'll stay the course that they have been on for quite a number of years now? Well, I'm sure that they have uh, noticed uh, with, with uh, all, all the people uh, working in the foreign department, they have taken notice of the international um, development involving in ch uh, China. Um, uh, our uh, alliance partners in the NATO is uh, now describing uh, China in other words uh, that just uh, used to to have just uh, a few years ago. So I think um, the, the, the public opinion in Norway will, will of course uh, inflict on our uh, policy, but they will still have to be 
um, balanced and cautious uh, and, and aligned with our uh, allies. We, we don't have the strength to, to have uh, our own uh, China policy. And I think every government, the previous and coming uh, governments will take uh, this into to their consideration. Standing with allies, that might become uh, very. Uh, uh, it, it might become very important if we look a few years into the future and uh, a, a potential conflict between uh, China and Taiwan, where the U.S. has now promised several times. Uh, I don't think it's a gaffe anymore when when Biden has said four times that he will defend Taiwan. Uh, Anish, uh, what, what do you think? What, what kind of implications will that have for for Norway if? if there was a conflict in the Taiwan Strait and the U.S. were to become involved? I think uh, the consequences will be huge. Uh, and I think uh, what's happening to us now, because uh, we are boycotting uh, uh, Russia and Russian goods, that is just uh, a small piece of what could be the result if uh, uh, there is going to be a conflict between the uh, United States and China, and we have to take sides then certainly uh, China would want to punish us and we m might uh, be forced into boycotts of goods from China um, if the Americans want us to do that. So that could be very, very difficult. So my recommendation is that we now um, try to uh, limit our dependence on uh, critical goods, especially medicine and medical equipment and other critical um, uh, components from China and start to find other um, trading partners in Europe uh, or other democratic countries or trying to start uh, producing them ourselves. Because um, I think uh, the, the uh, Norwegian society is so unprepared if there is uh, going to be a conflict between uh, uh, the U.S. and China over Taiwan. And uh, I also um, think that we should uh, start to, uh, or we should decrease the trade with China. Because as um, Michael said, um, China can use uh, our uh, trade as a, a tool to punish us, like they did with Australia when Australia wanted uh, an uh, independent inquiry into the COVID uh, origin. Uh, then China uh, punished uh, uh, Australia um, and didn't want to buy their goods anymore, or some of them, despite having a free trade agreement with them. So China will use every uh, tool they have. And, and uh, uh, we are a very small country, and we should be aware that we are so dependent and should start uh, to, uh, to limit that dependence, I think. And there are examples of small countries taking a very clear stand, uh, a stance in, in, on that issue, uh, for example, Lithuania. Uh, I'll give you the, the word. I just wanted to say that we have time for one, maybe two questions from the audience. So uh, think about uh, whether or not you have a question uh, while we uh, uh, listen to Kjetil. Yeah. Uh, this or trying to change, trying to find all the supply ch uh, chains uh, that's going on at the moment in most multinational uh, companies in the, uh, in the world. They're trying to find other places to find the minerals, to find, well, alternatives. I talked with the director of Otikla, the Norwegian group, uh, and they had just had a major review. They were going through literally thousands of products they have in the uh, in the uh, sell to the shops and see what each ingredients so uh, resistant that will be on well, uh, boycott actions and if they lost the su uh, supply of that and I think that's going on all over the world but because it's so big it will take time and as I say we do not what uh, where it will end up it will do it will take years but that is gradually shifting. They try to find uh, all the supplies. That's going on now. Do you think that would uh, that the Norwegian Petroleum Fund would be uh, thinking in the same uh, same terms? They live their own life. Jasmus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, but, but this is uh, the new strategy of the European Union, um, and they are doing this systematically, or are they, uh, or 
or have at least decided to do what uh, Anders Magnus says in a systematic matter uh, all across policy and uh, finance and trade. Uh, and of course that's going to influence Norway and of course it should sooner or later influence even the pension fund. Now, there is a question from, uh, from the audience. Oh, you're saying it's five minutes. <laughs> I mistook this for this. <laughs> Um, right, okay, th that means we do have time for, uh, a, was there a qu yes, there was a question. Yes, you, uh, you do have another ally in uh, Germany, called uh, Hungary. They have a very strong mm -hmm. relationship with Hungary. And what are we going to do with Korea? What we're going to do with Hungary? <laughs> <laughs> it might be New on the seminar. side of... Uh, <laughs> uh, they're, they're trying to do something with them, and <laughs> squeeze in the, uh, financially. But, but of course, they, they've got... There's France and well Germany. Yes, and of course we see that the EU is split now with Scholz traveling to to China for for his uh, trade talks. Yeah, um, for, for, we do have a, um, before we sort of uh, end here, uh, we can do a final short round to sort of summarize uh, what the four of you uh, think that Norway should do in the uh, in the coming. Uh, coming short uh, and middle term when it comes to to, to uh, relations to China. Uh, Anders, I think we'll, we'll start with you all the way over, uh, the, over the mountains in Bergen. I think uh, that uh, we should keep our uh, diplomatic relations as good as possible, but not thinking that we could influence uh, China in some way, uh, being uh, quiet or being loud. I think we are a very, very small partner. I think the most important thing for Norway now is to protect our own interests. And that goes to, um, uh, to secure that we are not going to be uh, cut off from very important uh, ingredients and, and, um, and uh, uh, products in our society uh, if there is going to be a cut off with China. It also Thank you. I think we should redefine uh, uh, what is a normal relationship to China. Uh, today it's more or less defined by the so-called normalization declaration, which is abnormal. Uh, we should get back to uh, a type of normality which is stating the obvious and being a nation that stands up for our own values. And doing what Anders Mangu says about uh, withdrawing from uh, dependence on China, uh, that can hurt us. Michael. I think we should maintain that we are self-confident on our uh, value basis, but we have uh, uh, no uh, room for experimenting at our own um, hand. We have to go with our allies, and I think all the Western has to do is to uh, uh, detangle from, from the de uh, dependency of, uh, of China. Um, I hope that there will come changes in China itself, because Xi Jinping is now uh, point by point uh, falling into the same pitfalls as his, uh, all uh, dictators uh, um, uh, um, flaws uh, by extending his power and at some time there will be uh, uh, problems within China and we see some I, I will recommend the last issue of foreign affairs where some from the inner circle is now pointing out what can, could happen. And in, uh, in a transition time after Xi Jinping, he, he could be very dangerous because uh, some of the experience also point that he could compensate um, lower <coughs> um, tolerance from his own um, uh, nomenclatura by being more risk-taking on the international uh, conflicts and, and maybe uh, take moves against uh, Taiwan, which should be hazardous. So, uh, but uh, 
we have to be also patient uh, and see that uh, if not, China will uh, again uh, be changed from inside. Yeah, do you get the final <coughs> word? Well, uh, <laughs> I think uh, the wisest thing to do is to stay very close to Europe and the European Union because, uh, well, uh, they share our values. They have the muscle financially to withstand any pre well, most pressure from China if that comes. Uh, so that we not stand at alone, but as it happened with Lithuania, now that they get some kind of solidarity, and we, we need to build up the, uh, build up that uh, that as well. Uh, and it is so low behavior now. We're going into a period with regularization, with well, maybe some deglobalization, and well, then we need to stay close to those who are closest to us. All right, we'll end it at that. Uh, Anders Magnus, uh, Lasmus Hansson, Mikhail Tetschnit, and Seattle Wietzwang, thank you very much for uh, coming here today, and thank you for all of you too for coming as well.